that 44% of women were the study goes on to say that many women, 39%, wished men would reject their offers to pay and that 44% of women were bothered when men expected to help women pay. That's 2015, folks, not 1983. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And I'm not blaming women for any of this. The superficial and ultimately meaningless feminist blather about empowering females aside, our society still conditions women to see men as machines, designed and built to serve the lives of women. Indeed, the exploitation of men is exactly what feminists count on, or they wouldn't even exist. Our entire economy, our governance, and even our families are predicated on this unabashedly gynocentric model. Do we really expect women as a class to reject this level of conditioning for the sake of decency and fairness that they've never been held to in their lives? And of course, men largely see themselves in the same way. Men so thoroughly dedicate themselves to this way of existing that they feel shame for taking money from a woman under any circumstances. 76% of them, according to that study. Get that. Most men feel ashamed of asking a woman to simply carry some of her own weight. That shame is the very thing that relationally aggressive women exploit to get their way. Chris Rock was 100% correct. As a rule, women are annoyed by their men having leisure time. And so how do women keep the pressure up to keep the machine running and servicing her needs? Simple. It's RA, relational aggression. And the number one asset that women have in their RA arsenal is masculine shame. The psychological abuse of nagging or belittling a blue pill man for not being productive produces shame in him because internally he believes that it degrades his social standing as a man. Men know exactly how society measures them up. We know about this from our understanding of precarious manhood. That understanding informs us that manhood, in contrast to womanhood, is seen as a precarious state requiring continual social proof and validation. Study link below. Shame is the abusive woman's backhand. When she berates a man for not being productive, she is just manipulating him to serve her selfish ends or to get him to do things she won't bother to do for herself. And with men's manhood being a matter of social standing, we then understand that she isn't just nagging. She's being relationally aggressive. It's important for men to see her relational aggression in the exact same way society would tell her to view his physical aggression. Now, we don't need shelters or anything of the sort, but we do need men to understand that the only thing to do with a woman who uses shame to control and abuse is to wheel her to the curb with the rest of your garbage. That's where that kind of woman belongs. Even if no one else hears or sees the abuse, the attacks register and take their psychological toll for as long as you're willing to be a victim. In many cases, however, you won't be the only one involved. Many women will recruit friends, relatives, and even their own children to act as audience members and cheerleaders for her attacks. This behavior is the predictive precursor to the full-blown parental alienation and false accusations that will come to pass when divorce or breakup occurs. Parental alienation and false allegations are purely acts of relational aggression designed to destroy your relationships right along with your social standing. They are driven by the same defect of character that leads her to berate you for spending some time on the sofa. These kinds of women, and they are legion, aren't just annoyed by a man's inactivity. Many of them are annoyed by men engaging in activities that are solely for the benefit or enjoyment of the man. I can't even remember how many men I've known who reported that hobbies, interests, and even close friendships had disappeared from their lives because they were met with relational aggression by a woman. Not even the work you do as a provider is immune. 
I doubt if there is anyone in the Western world who is not familiar with the theme of onerous financial demands being placed on men who are then vilified by their dependent women because their work takes them away from home. One of the very first essays I wrote on men's issues, A Prayer for Joe Bob, linked below, addressed this, even suggesting a connection between men coping with relational aggression and suicide. What I tried to get at in that piece, even if I didn't know it at the time, was that what we call romantic love for men is frequently predicated on surrendering to the subtle tyranny of a woman's abusive control. And of course, maintaining that abuse of control depends on men not talking about it or even recognizing it. And that's too bad for men who comply because if you can't have your own interests outside your relationship, your own friends, your own identity, you can't be a whole person. And that's the point. Whole human beings don't tolerate abuse. So the targets of relational aggression must be made less than whole. Everything about them, from their interests and friendships to their very view of themselves, must be chipped away at till they are weak and isolated enough to fully control. Men's challenge, therefore, is laid bare for consideration. Because this area, where men either hold on to their interests and individuality or surrender them, is the mother of all crossroads. It is quite literally where the rubber meets the road, where men and mice part ways. Did I say where men and mice part ways? Well, in a healthier red pill world, this would be where a lot of men and women part ways. I normally shy away from any attempts to define manhood for anyone but myself. I think that's a dangerous business. But if I were to start qualifying what I thought a real man was, I think I'd say that a real man would be able to look any relationally aggressive woman directly in the eye and say the following. I've got friendships and other interests outside this relationship that I will be maintaining for as long as I care to. And if you ever try in any way to force me to choose between any of them or you, then I will choose them every time. And of course he has to mean it. For anyone who thinks that sounds cold, you're right. And it should be. RA is nothing but relationship poison. I don't care what her intentions were, or rather what she says her intentions were. RA is a dark sickness that our society instills in women, one that destroys the lives of men who allow it. It is a form of emotional terrorism with which you are foolish to receive with anything but savage rejection. Hear this. The woman who will shame you for kicking back on the couch or for making time for your friends is the same woman who will say you sexually molested your children or that you were violent with her when divorce papers are served. Bank on it. Many men also make the mistake of engaging in a protracted relationship battle, dodging the bullets, trying to game their way around her constant emotional onslaughts, attempting to hang on to any fragment of their lives they enjoyed before the relationship started. Bad move, guys. Many women see this, and quite accurately, as a battle that they will win. She wins by even getting you to fight about it in the first place. This is one game where the only winning move is to totally upend the board. This isn't supposed to be a battle for you to engage. It's an edict for you to issue. If your individuality, your wholeness as a person, is up for debate with anyone, then you've already lost 